The Higher Side Chats doesn't start with underwear ads or guilt-tripping donation pleas, nor would I ever commit the cardinal sin of podcasting and interrupt the flow mid-show to show you an unrelated sponsor. But the free first hour episodes do have to start with a little PSA before we get into it to ever so quickly remind slash inform listeners both old slash new that you're about to get into what I'm sure is a great first hour of a high level interview, but that means you're missing half the show. If you like what we do around here, get yourself a THC Plus membership and listen to the full two hour interviews as they were really designed to be and as I know you would enjoy them most. Give a little and actually get a little more in return of the thing you're actually engaging with. Five episodes every month, plus forum access, community comments, downloads to all the closing cover songs, a plus show RSS feed to use with any private RSS feed supported app, and the occasional joint session bonus shows, which include the messages you might leave me about your own theories, experiences, or otherworldly encounters at thehiresidechats.com slash voicemail. If you're not quite sure, if you just want to feel us out, or if you're only here for this particular episode, no worries. New first-time subscribers get a seven-day free trial when you sign up at thehiresidechats.com. Cancel anytime. Try it out, because it's so important to feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go. And with that said, let's get on with it already, huh? In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. All right, another day, another deep dive into this weird world, Higher Side Chatters. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood. And somewhere between the daily grind and the nightly news, we know there are many energetic and magical mechanisms that are not advertised to the huddled masses. And it seems like these days, every button is being pushed and lever pulled to disempower us, erode our financial footing, and limit our access to quality education, natural food, and optimum H2O. If you ask me, we have more reasons to reach into the magical toolbox than ever, and any extra oomph we can get to help us beat back the big machine and even just tread water in these troubled times is worth hearing about, because conventional methods of making it just aren't working out as well. And what if we actually have a resource we've been neglecting all this time? Well, lay down your judgments and unclutch your pearls, because today we're getting deep into the world of sex magic with someone who's been exploring this realm for most of his life, returning guest Alan Greenfield. Alan has been an occultist since 1960 and has practiced ceremonial magic almost just as long. He spent two decades climbing the ranks of the OTO only to leave the structured organization for a more independent and individualistic path to illumination. And he's explored and experimented with the powerful realm of sex magic all along the journey, and it's facilitated, as he says, some of his most profound and potent magical experiences. His book on the topic, The Grail Within, The True Quest for the Holy Grail and the Western Magical Tradition, was originally privately printed but not published in a limited edition of just 93 copies and hand-distributed to other senior adepts. The Grail Within is Alan's exploration of the central secret of many Western mystery schools and is now out there in a recently released new edition of the book published for the first time. He's also a 35-year veteran in ufology and UFO investigative work, which we mainly focused on in our last interview about his book Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts and Secret Rituals of the Men in Black, two books he wrote in the 90s that have now been reprinted as a single volume called The Complete Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, which played a big role in the popular Hellier series. It's certainly a pleasure to have him back, the esoteric Don Juan sex magic maestro and master of his domain. Alan, my man, welcome back to the higher side. Good evening. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. Uh, I hope I don't sound too sinister. It is actually the first time that this is in print, published, because, I mean, 93 copies hand distributed free of charge was essentially intended, as you said, for initiates, a very 
sophisticated initiates and I got good feedback, but probably if I were doing that today, some of those people would definitely be off the list because <laughs> they had the right credentials, but if you explored their points of view, it was very dogmatic. And that's one thing I discourage heavily, which is any kind of dogmatism about things sexual to begin with and things magically sexual even more so. Fair enough. We are a dogma-free zone, I would say. And I definitely enjoyed our last interview about the complete secret cipher of the euphonauts. And while this sex magic topic is a completely different thing, we all have sex if we're lucky enough. Most of us can say the orgasm is probably the most powerful energetic experience we've had soberly. If it can be harnessed and channeled into putting some extra potency behind our manifestation abilities or magical potency in general, why not, right? Well, that's a good approach. I think that uh, exceptions noted sexuality is available to everyone, but focusing in such a way as to make sexual magic work is an art unto itself. And you probably need to spend a couple of years learning sitting meditation first. That would be true of any branch of magic because there are freaky moments. And uh, in addition to meditation, then you need to have some knowledge of ritual magic. And at that point, you can integrate, if you choose, your personal sexual life with your magical knowledge and use the great potent power of sexuality. I'm not even sure you could call sexual situations being in an ordinary state of mind. I think that there are endorphins involved and all sorts of internal chemistry that some people try to duplicate with external sources with some success, but also brain fog, <laughs> which is probably not the best way to be when you're doing something of a magical nature regardless. And there we go. I mean, the book is, it fills a need that other books that have dealt with Tantra in the East and sexual magic in the West tend to be obscure. And when they talk about it, they talk about what? They talk about the theory. And their theory is sometimes limited, <laughs> but they don't talk about their own personal practice. I, don't, I can only think of one book ever, and it's an obscure book by Lewis Culling way, way back that influenced me and apparently nobody else, <laughs> but it briefly discusses his own experiences. And he was a member of a schismatic group, I guess, that had its origin in the OTO, the Esoteric Order of God or something <laughs> equally <laughs> pretentious. He was just a member, but he carried on that work single-handedly, and I think it possibly it's not on my radar anymore, so it probably died with him, but was reborn with me because I read it and I thought, hey, this sounds really good. So most of my book, once I've stated the same thing that you can get from a dozen other books, although more decoratively discussed, <laughs> I try to go into my personal experiences, not all of them, but enough so that it was painful to write because it's very personal. And I felt like somebody who has been a practitioner of one or another form of sexual magic in the West, there are accounts of Tantra and Kundalini yoga that would scare anybody off. If you read Gopi Krishna, you'll never meditate Kundalini because he had an experience that lasted a lifetime. Uh, not a good one, but that was a spontaneous experience. And I think the Western tradition has more controls built into it, unless somebody just naively plunges in, so to speak, no pun intended. And there you go. So I wanted to talk about that because it's not typical. 
in fact, it's non-existent as far as I know. If somebody knows a title that, you know, deals with that, fine. But the Holy Grail referred to there is symbolic of sexual relations, heterosexual sexual relations. If one has attended a Gnostic Mass, you have all that the OTO can really teach if you really know what the symbolism is. So you can just go once, put your dollar in the collection box or whatever, and leave, which is my advice. Don't <laughs> play that game because I don't know any more about that than I did the day I got involved. But, you know, the priest puts the lance in the cup of red wine and drops the particle. You don't need Fellini to figure that out. Train goes into the tunnel. <laughs> the tide comes in. I mean, it's all on display. And it's not like they have all of the secrets. Their innermost guarded secret, which has been published like a gazillion times in various books. There are other quote, secrets. That is, there's an absence of public information. And I go into some of those briefly with some because they're not my thing. And then in more detail with others. Like there's, I don't go into this more than just a mention, but there's a whole thing involving sexual bondage that has magical implications if you look for it. Hmm. At one time, I attended an event at a BDSM club where a guy was trying to get a group organized to look into the spiritual aspects of bondage, which has plenty of those. But of course, that's a very specialized area and you have to be into it for it to have that kind of juice that you're looking for. But all initiation, if you reduce it to its core, is induced crisis and resolution. And then the realizations that grow out of that resolution, that's, you know, that's every degree and every system that ever was created. And certainly that would apply to the bondage thing. But I didn't go into that. I went into <laughs> mainly solo sex magic and my involvement with various people who appear under other names than their own. <laughs> so yes. It's not for their protection. It's because I don't like being sued particularly. There you go. Well, I do appreciate the boldness in the book and getting past all the euphemisms because so often you get into a magical text and it's just layered and all this allegory and euphemisms and you're almost like, I don't even know if I'm identifying all the symbolism correctly and uh, you just kind of spell it out there, which I think is important. And there is a lot of mystique around initiatory magical orders and secret societies in general. And to say that the central secret of these organizations is sex magic, I mean, it's pretty provocative. That's what it's all about in these places. The big secret at the apex of the uh, initiatory orders is just sex magic? Yep. That's it. Huh. Sorry to be brief, but <laughs> that's all that they have to teach. Now, they do have a, in certain orders, they have a homosexual degree that most people don't take except gay people, I guess, if they want it, and it's rare. But they really have no further notions of what one can do. You find inspiration in certain Eastern practices, and I find mine, in the hidden gem of Western sexual magic, which is P.B. Randolph's writings, which I refer to in the book. And I believe my publisher has brought out a, an edition of Randolph's secret teachings on sexual magic. It's basically that same, you know, innermost secret, but as he said, and I use the term printed, not published. But now it can be told it's published too. So <laughs> there it is out there. So talk to us about what a person can get out of exploring some of the rites and techniques that comprise the sex magic corpus. I mean, increased manifestation seems to be a big one. But there's got to be a lot more, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it facilitates things like distant remote viewing, and it can facilitate a precognition. It also 
and it has a great potential for dark-sided stuff. It can create the manifestation of what Edward Alexander Crowley called the bud will, which is more or less like the Tibetan notion of a tulpa, which I think is what, going back to the UFO stuff, what the men in black are usually about. They're not separate beings. They are manifestations that are temporary and set in motion by the magician, in this case, the sex magician, who concentrates on generating what well, you can call it chi, prana, organ, dark energy, whatever you want to call it, into a temporary being that does your wishes. Some would say will, but I think that that's probably overly optimistic. Sometimes it's pretty nefarious stuff. And I hope at rock bottom, that's not anyone's will, hmm. except Putin, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Sorry. All good. You can bleep that if you want to, but uh, let me say one thing about that. Okay? okay. Significant thing. It's not about him personally. Really? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But people of my generation so often had dreams of being in a nuclear war that Dr. Spock, not to be confused with Mr. Spock, who wrote Baby and Child Care the year I was born, revised his edition late in life to talk to parents about what to do with their children's nuclear war fears. Well, after the Soviet Union went the way of all Soviet unions to that great collective in the sky or wherever it may be, trying to be delicate about this. I had no more nuclear war dreams. I have lots of nightmares of various sorts because when you, you know, you fish in the waters, I fish in, there's fishy stuff that comes off and it tends to emerge at night. I had one last night. Uh oh. First time in 30 years, I had a nuclear war dream and I was going into my, well, I don't want to get too personal on this, but I, I have a box that is my end of the world box, you know, and there's, you know, things that you would need at the end of the world so that it isn't the end of you. Yes. And I opened the box, unlocked it, opened it and put on a helmet, a PSAT standard military issue helmet and put on a sidearm. And then all the lights went out everywhere. And first they said, well, it must be a power failure. And then it turned out it was an electromagnetic pulse from somewhere on the other side of the world. Now, that isn't prophetic. That just represents it's, a, like you were saying, very troubled times. And I hope that this isn't going to be inflict what my generation experienced where a nuclear holocaust was sort of assumed and that it would be apocalyptic isn't foisted on the millennials and post-millennials and post-post-millennials who have had the good fortune to grow up without nuclear war being a factor, although there's no nuclear disarmament, so it's still there. Right. It's never really off the table, but as you say, I've talked to a lot of people of your generation who were really traumatized by that, and fear is a powerful thing. It seems like they're always injecting fear from one angle or another. And they're bringing out the old nuclear script again. And uh, it is a scary thing. But I guess we control the things we can control. and We don't worry too much about the rest. But of course, the dream world is also oftentimes very insightful, especially with someone who plays in those waters. You know, the, the dreams seem to be a little more potent and a little more meaningful. But coming back to the sex magic thing, what do you think are the mechanics involved that make a sexual component to one's magical aim? more potent, especially something like astral travel or remote viewing or manifestation. I mean, obviously the imagination is typically involved. Uh, visualization in that place is typically involved. But what would be the mechanics of sex improving one's potency in some of those areas? Because it might not seem immediately obvious. Well, it is the case that people usually are intensely focused during sexual activities. It's inherent in the process itself. Whatever one is doing, you're focused 
on it and in an altered state of consciousness. Now, there are other ways to induce altered states of consciousness. Chemical ways, ritual ways, spontaneous ways, but sexuality is a handy and almost universally accessible way to be aware of that energy. Your brain is doing things chemically that bring that out. Your body is doing things physically and biologically that bring that aspect of reality out. It's kind of a sacrifice. Alistair Crowley was once asked in one of his many lawsuits, have you ever sacrificed a person? And he said, well, I, I sacrifice thousands of babies every day. He was referring to masturbation, but it, mm -hmm. it was lost on the court, and he lost the case, if I remember correctly. I mean, he has faded into being one of those, you know, one of those people who know about magic and try to do something in the modern sense. And I used to think he was like the key person. Now I think he's one among many and probably secondhand influenced by P.B. Randolph and the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. Maybe he wasn't a primary, but in any case, what happens is, I think, and this is the way I describe it, um, either draws energy from the universe. What energy is drawn? Again, those terms, the term depends on the culture that it arises in, but it arises in all cultures the prana or chi or dark energy is the latest term. That is the energy of things that aren't, but are. <laughs> Which Ether, is, you could say. That, yeah. It doesn't make any sense except if you have studied quantum physics, which one doesn't have to be a PhD physicist, which I am not, to grasp the basic points that are found. And it's totally beyond logic, not illogic. It's just beyond logic because nothing makes sense in the practical sense in the quantum universe. It's like Euclidean geometry, geo being earth, makes sense for things that are earth commensurate uh, distances, but it doesn't make any sense when you're talking about distant stars or galaxies or whatever. It's the other end of the universe or even at the restaurant at the end of the universe, but that's a different story. So that energy is harnessed every time anyone has an intense sexual experience, but it dissipates in one of two ways. And I get this from the influence that Dr. Wilhelm Reich had on me, mostly in his book, The Function of the Orgasm and its sequel, The Cancer Biopathy, which wound him up in Lewisburg Federal Prison for the rest of his life because mm -hmm. they don't like, they, you know, the they oh, know. don't like <laughs> uh, <laughs> the notion of something coming from outside of the standard pharmacopoeia, as it were. And uh, Reich was fearless and wound up a martyr for the cause, really. And I nevertheless think that his theories about Americans being orgasmically dysfunctional in the sense that the full experience by and large is not experienced by many men and most women, partly because of past or present social repression, and partly, I think, because of something fundamental in the character of this society. But if you fully experience it, then you have, well, what do you do with that energy? Nature abhors a vacuum, which actually doesn't exist. And therefore, it either dissipates as one gets past the experience, or it vegetates, in which case, going back to Reich, it turns into something that is no longer positive and life-affirming, or it goes into creating a physical child, or in the magical sense, it goes into creating a difference in reality, not necessarily a big one. Big ones are really hard to find. 
I was active in the peace movement back in the Vietnam era. That was a war many, many thousands of years ago. And the kookier people got together in the thousands and surrounded the Pentagon and tried to levitate the building. That is dumb. You know, <laughs> maybe you could influence one general's thinking. The men who stare at goats is a fair example of government interest in the possibilities of paranormal mind control. And that's the same energy that I'm talking about here. The difference is that in sexual magic, one is focused on turning that energy that is developed in the passionate moment into something in reality that alters reality just a tad. The example that I use in the book, one of them, is the technique is called scrying in the flesh, which kind of gives the whole thing away if you <laughs> think about the term. But I let's see, I was 40 a thousand years ago when the dinosaurs ruled the earth. And I really was going through one of several financial crises. And I took a job that was, it was fortunate that I had been staying at my mother's apartment, which was upstairs from the European health spa for a couple of months. So I was as buff as I've ever been in my life, you know, just out there. And I couldn't have done this job because it was, I got hired by an ex-neighbor actually to do warehouse work, uh, picking and packing, they call it. And it was 120 degrees because summer, and it was cold in the winter, incredibly hot in the summer, and virtually all the other employees except management were 20 years younger than me. So, you know, it wasn't a competition or anything, but I had to, you know, pull my weight or leave. Because I, I was getting minimum wage, which at that time was $5.50 an hour and working 10, 11 hour days. And I hated it, of course. Everybody hates that kind of job. There are side stories I could tell you, but it was, it was awful. So I started to think, hey, when I'm off duty here, rarely, and awake, even rarer, I'm a magician. And instead of hoping, which I actually found myself doing, that a box would fall on me so I could get workers' comp, I can do some magic. And at the time, I had a partner, I believe I called her Shamara in the book, but very talented magician herself, actually into organized magic before me. So we discussed doing the scrying in the flesh technique designed to get my boss to move me, this is improbable, from being a warehouse hand to being a purchasing agent or something, you know, to get me off of that sweat box and onto the main floor with the cubicles and some job. Right. Going from the, uh, from the warehouse to corporate. It's a tough move. Yeah, tough move. But I was kind of desperate. <laughs> and highly motivated. So the book details the technique and anybody that has practiced magic can do it, but I want them to buy the book. So I'm not going to, you know, give the exact details of it, but suffice to say this at the critical moment, i.e. when I had an orgasm, I would project myself into various environments. And one of those, the main one really, not necessarily the most esoteric, was I would see my boss, the ultimate boss, the capo de capo tutti. <laughs> the boss said, no, no, actually, an elderly Jewish gentleman. But it seemed like he was the, the Don, you know. So I would see his face, and I didn't put words in his mouth, but the words that came out were, you're hired at $50,000 a year. And I did this over and over until my partner got tired of <laughs> doing it because it's, a, it's several hours worth of ritual. 
I was back at work on top of a ladder carrying two boxes of binfang board, whatever the hell that is, it's heavy. So I'm balancing it on both hands at the top of a ladder and up comes the guy who had recently been hired to be the hatchet man, you know, basically to go through the entire firm and get rid of the people that he saw as being excessive. In other words, that he was hired to fire people. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, uh, okay, what does he want? And he asked me a question about my background. Now, I knew that this guy was a dual Israeli-American citizen, which is kind of odd, but nothing wrong with that. It's legal and was a strange sort of guy to begin with. And that's a strange kind of job. So I was wary about what I would say to him and what he would say to me. What he said amounted to, well, there's a group of us that are looking to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So what am I going to say? Said, well, that's interesting. And I think about the entire Islamic world <laughs> coming down on Israel, which is a population of what, 8 million, something like that, because there is the third most sacred Islamic shrine in the very spot, coincidentally, <laughs> keeping in mind that I don't think there is any such thing as a coincidence, <laughs> that the, uh, the first and second temple were built in biblical times. So I said, oh, really? You're interested in that? He said, yeah. And I understand you are a Kohen. Uh, Kohen in Judaism is the hereditary priesthood that is like 3,000 years old, which sounds like one of those, you know, founding fantasies, but actually recent DNA stuff shows it's an intact tradition, but it runs through the male line. And my mother was the youngest of 12 and was a daughter of a Kohen. But because my inheritance from that was non-Kohen because it goes through the male line. And my grandfather on my father's side was well, he ran a saloon in Baltimore, so <laughs> he was not a Kohen or anything of the sort. But I thought, it won't hurt. And anyway, it's 110, and I'm on top of it. So I said, oh, yeah, right. And he said, well, you shouldn't be working in this warehouse because we need people like you. I said, people like me, okay. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this was a really a long shot, so I was kind of just, you know, playing it. By the way, I get the psychic message that a black cat just crossed your path. <laughs> yes, you did indeed. That's <laughs> why I usually don't record with the uh, camera on because this cat won't leave me alone. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so oh, the dog across the hall will start barking at me. Uh, he's the only dog I've ever heard who literally says bow wow. Goes bow wow, bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. <laughs> Not wolf, bow wow. I wondered where that came from. So now it's the chihuahua across the hall. It barks every time I walk in my kitchen, which I, anyway. So where was I? I digressed too far and now I'm lost in the maze of my mind. Well, it seemed like your boss was inquiring about your background and people like to help people that they have something in common with. And that seemed to be the catalyst that made the sex magic ritual come full circle. Yeah. And this is how it happened. I mean, that the way that it happened, he was not my boss. He was the hatchet man. Oh, yes. But having worked like maybe two days later, first he offered to fire on the spot. A uh, woman that was a salesperson, I said, I can't be in sales. I don't drive and you have to drive to, you know, be a, as they put it at another job that I had, a do to do salesman. Hmm. You have to be mobile and I'm that rare item in the deep south. I'm not for a variety of reasons. And it's over there. <laughs> um, so having worked an 11-hour shift 
and my back aching. I go to the bus stop and I'm sitting slumped over waiting for the rare bus that went through this industrial area where I was working. And the boss comes up, the real boss comes up to me in his Cadillac. I would say rolls down his window, but of course it was electric. So he lowers his window and he says, hey, Alan. And I go, uh, yeah, that's me. That is I. He said, what do you know about a purchasing agent? I said, absolutely nothing. This was in the art supply business about which I knew absolutely nothing. It was, you know, carrying boxes doesn't require a great deal of knowledge of what's in the box. Right, right. Uh, as long as it wasn't a Dybbuk box, but that's a different program and we'll get there <laughs> someday. So I said, I really don't know anything about that. And he said, business is business. Doesn't matter. We have an opening for a purchasing agent and I want you in the job starting tomorrow. I thought, jackpot. Mm -hmm. It worked. And to make matters even, I'm not even sure that the guy that I had the tete-a-tete -tete with on the ladder was a real person and not a tulpa because a couple of days later, he disappeared mysteriously. He left a message on the machine saying he was leaving. And I mean, he was not in disrepute in any way, but he was gone. In fact, it was on the same day that in the neighborhood that he lived in, a girl that turned out to have been murdered was missing. And he was investigated by the FBI. I don't think they ever caught up with him, but they found the person that killed the young lady. But hmm. he was, you know, he left at a suspicious time and was inherently a suspicious person. But I think maybe he was just gone, gone, you know, mm -hmm. like no longer among the earthlings. Well, it's such a interesting story that really does provide a great example of how this stuff can work. You spend the time doing this ritual, this extended scrying in the flesh ritual, manifesting or visualizing the thing you want to come into being. And I've heard magic expressed as a probability multiplier. So if you get around a building and you try to levitate it, well, the probability is pretty low. So even to move that a little bit is still awfully low. Uh, but if you're trying to manifest something that makes sense in reality, even if it does require some pieces on the board moving into place in the right way, well, you're going to have a better chance with that. And so what you just laid out is a really good example of something that could manifest. It's a very specific aim, and it seems like it worked out. And I like to give people pretty practical advice or ways to use the tools. And of course, elements of sex magic broadly that I have heard before your book and obviously in your book too is prolonged, extended, uh, pre-orgasmic state, not getting to the uh, apex before too early and keeping that mental focus there. Uh, another technique I often hear is kind of sitting uh, almost in each other's lap and trying to sync up your breathing, uh, your rhythmic breathing and keeping a, a eye contact and trying to create like a, uh, a cycle of energy, a welling up of energy with those mental things in mind. I guess if there are people listening, they're like, man, you know, it's tough out there right now. As you know, it's it's pretty crazy. And they need their desires to manifest. There maybe maybe some people are pretty desperate for their desires to manifest in this window of time where maybe they have an opportunity. What are some of those other things, assuming they have worked on their visualization and assuming they have done some breath work and have done the fundamentals to get themselves into the position? Uh, if they have a wife or partner or even by themselves, how can they give a little extra oomph to their manifestation abilities? Well, I should say that I had been a practitioner of one or another form of occultism at that time, at the time that particular ritual was done for about 20 years. So it's not done cold. It's not like if you read it and 
there's a set of instructions. A, you do this. B, you do that. C, you do that. It manifests. It's Magic is not that simple or everybody would be a magician and the stock market would belong to magicians and not to the captains of industry. <laughs> so you do need some background. And as I said at the top of the show, that requires some prerequisites like anything of any importance. One of them is some form of meditation. I recommend jhana or called China and, China and Zen in Japan, a sitting meditation simply because it centers you. There are magical rituals like the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram that can be done on a daily basis. And I'm not much in favor of memorization because then it becomes rote and loses its meaning. But that's one that is fairly easy to commit to memory and serves you well when magic goes wrong because there is a dark side to sex magic as any other form of magic. If you want to know how it can go wrong, find the 1956 Academy Award nominated, beaten by the Ten Commandments, Forbidden Planet. Starring Leslie Nielsen before he became a comedian. Yes. And imagine yourself to be the Krell, the beings that harnessed their mental energy through machinery, went to sleep the night that they had done that and were eaten up by their own inner selves, projected outward. And apparently the machines, well, I'm not going to spoil the whole movie because I think it's one of the 10 best science fiction movies ever made mm. and shows that Leslie Nielsen didn't just have a sense of humor <laughs> and good timing. But it is true that we all have demons inside of us. And if you go to bring out change in accordance with your own desires, wishes, or will, there are things that probably are on your plate that unless you've had what Israel Regardi recommended, I think it was a minimum of 200 hours of psychotherapy before getting involved in any kind of magic. I don't expect people to do that, but you really do need to know yourself pretty well, including the stuff that you don't like about yourself, because whether your, your intention is that or not, the reality is that that stuff will come out in a magical context, whether it's sex magic or, you know, ritual magic or Enochian magic or what have you. It has a tendency to manifest at some point, which is why there are all kinds of guards involved in various forms of magic. And even with those guards, shit happens. <laughs> right. Well. Obviously, people should be careful engaging with any of this stuff, and those prerequisites are certainly important. But even just something simple like, I mean, in my job, there is no raise, really. There is no next level. It's just like more subscribers. So I feel like uh, there's really no harm in, in trying to think and focus on, I want to double my paid membership every time I orgasm with or without somebody else. Uh, and I, I don't know, I could put that on the table. Uh, or if me and my wife, we might want to uh, move to Texas and do a homesteading type lifestyle instead of where we are. And uh, we tell each other, why not think about that and think about like, let, may the perfect homesteading location cross our paths. May we find something that resonates with us and uh, may that align well. I mean, why not? We've had sex several thousand times. We should probably put it to use. We're wasting a lot of energy here. <laughs> well, you know, you make a good point there, which is kind of why I released the book from its obscurity, because there is a school of thought, and I have been admonished by the great poobahs of magic. Well, this is something you can't release to the public because the great unwashed are not fit to do that. That's baloney. You can't use it unless you understand it. And if you understand it, you're as worthy as anybody else to make use of it. So 
my tendency is to say, well, if you want to move to a homestead in, I'd recommend Nevada, not Texas, but that's just my. Too hot, no water. <laughs> well, until the flood comes, which uh, <laughs> uh, the geologists say is overdue, but it's much simpler to do something like candle magic, which is what they call low magic. It's a form of hoodoo, and I've done that. I can't say that it preceded doing anything of a sexual nature, but there's nothing. Unless you think of candles as phallic objects, which can be done, <laughs> you get a green candle and you go down to the local curio store or dimple store or whatever the hoodoo shop in town calls itself, and you buy yourself a green candle and some anointing oil, like, let's say, in the particular ritual that I'm thinking about, another time in my life when I really needed money, because you don't do these things for frivolous purposes. You do them for life-changing needs, you know. Yes, yes. Cure your mother's cancer, whatever. It's important to reserve it for important things. If you do it for getting a better grade on your test, the forces in the universe have a way of admonishing you for that, that sort of silliness. I think I may be wrong about this, but I think Crowley once said the magic for opening a door is you go to the door, you turn the knob and open, which is his sort of humor, not mine. But the point is, if you try mind control to open the door, that's so trivial that you're basically uh, spilling your seed upon the ground. Literally or metaphorically. Yes. Don't ask for things that you can easily accomplish without invoking the gods. Right. I did this little ritual. I dressed the candle. I read whatever the store said to read for that. Lit the candle. And the next day, I get a call from my mother who said, Oh, your father just got a death benefit. He'd been dead for like five years at that point. Of $800, so I decided to give it to you. Hmm. I said, no problemo, mama. <laughs> and that alleviated my immediate situation. And another thing during that period that did involve sexual magic with my partner at that time was I spent about a year in Tampa, Florida before going on to the Tucson and the University of Arizona environment and stuff like that. I called Tampa temporary. I did start a magical group down there that had long range benefits and repercussions. But my partner was looking for work. She was a professional belly dancer, and there just wasn't, Tampa was at that time, maybe still, a very a socially conservative town. Couldn't even get an ad for the, a classified ad for the, magical group I was trying to form in the newspaper, the local newspaper, because they said, this is too weird for us. So I said, oh, but I'm a minister of the Universal Life Church, which cost me $5, I think, or something. And so that made it into the Tampa Tribune. But anyway, so we did a sexual magic ritual that involved anal intercourse, oh. probably illegal in Florida at the time. but to get her a good position. Now, what we were hoping for was something along the lines of she would get a gig there. For a while, she was working for various holiday inns around the country because she was a really good belly dancer. In fact, I don't think there are any around as good today as she was. So we did the ritual, and the next day, she gets a call from the Florida Academy of Ballet. They said, well, we had a belly dance teacher because that was a very trendy thing at the time. And so she's going to Egypt. So would you like to take the job, which was a prestige job? And it wasn't lost on us, the timing of that. So a mm -hmm. uh, somewhat outre ritual became manifest within 24 hours. I like it. They aren't all that simple, but yeah, that's, you know, if you're motivated and it's something you really need, you know, it's likely to work. 
although always in an unexpected way. It's like if you have a, you know, I want a Rolls Royce circa 1938 with a chauffeur. You ain't going to get it. I don't care what you do or who you go to bed with. It just ain't going to happen. But I have a thousand dollar repair bill on my car, they say. And you find out the next day you can take it to a different shop for a hundred dollars and it just comes out of nowhere. You get a leaflet through the mail that says hundred dollars to, you know, fix your motor. And I wish somebody would fix my motor and I don't have a car. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, I hear examples like that all the time. So let me ask you this. Uh, you know, in the particular example that you gave, you went with the anal magic and then you were saying for the homesteading thing, well, you don't have to do sex magic. You just do candle magic. Well, why not always go for the most potent thing? And what is the most potent thing? I mean, and also with candle magic for the audience who isn't aware, I think you you light the candle and you visualize the thing in the flame of the candle. You sit there with it and you think about uh, w what it is you want. But why did you invoke anal sex magic that time instead of regular old sex magic? Or why didn't you just light the candle? I mean, how do you stack up? Uh, how do you rank these things in terms of potency and know where to go for what particular aim? That's the reason for the meditation and the prerequisite general knowledge of magic. You develop an intuitive sense that if it works repeatedly, then you pretty well know it just comes into your head. Maybe the secret chiefs of the third order are whispering in your ear. Doesn't matter really how it happens. But once you take that path and have moved along it, you know, it's like I've been reading tarot since 1962. First reading was for my mother. And so I'm, I may be the senior most tarot reader in America at this point, unless some Romany person, elderly Romany person has been reading longer than that. I don't know anybody that's been reading that long, but I don't know that many people that are alive that long. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, it's neither here nor there, but it's here. I, at that time, way back in 1962, there were only, I think, two tarot decks available. And one was the little black and white deck from the Church of Light in California, which was a spinoff of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. And the other one was the uh, so-called weight deck or rider pack, actually the Pamela Coleman Smith, who doesn't always get the credit, the artist who did the deck. And it was basically based on the internal deck of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which had long since ceased to exist, despite what you may hear otherwise. So I got the book that went with it that Wade wrote, and I got the cards. I forget who I got it from, probably U.S. Games, the first organization. I think they also did Ouija boards, you know, so they were hmm. into all kinds of games, fun and games. And for the first couple of years, I would do whatever layout that they described. The Celtic cross generally is what they recommended. And then look up the cards in the book. Came the time when the book wasn't there and I needed to use the cards and I found, I know what these cards mean now. I mean, I don't need any prompting and they may differ from the book, but I've developed that particular magical power, if you will. I could read them. And then I've had, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole 60 years of that, but I've had additional breakthroughs and they're always sudden, but you develop an unerring sense of this is the way to do this. And I wound up spending five years working for the Psychic Friends Network as a master psychic, which I'm not really sure what that is because I got paid the same thing as the non-master psychics, you know, <laughs> 25 cents a talk minute, three ninety nine for the customer. Wow. Yeah. Well, the IRS jumped down their throat and they went out of business. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't hear about Miss Cleo or any of her colleagues much anymore. Well, I was um, Dion. Dion Warwick was the front person for it. So I said, I work for Dion, you know? <laughs> yeah. Don't hold me responsible. Talk to the man. Uh, well, so, okay. So you're saying that, you know, you think about what you are wanting and then something comes to mind that you should engage with and 
In this example, your girl needed a job and it just came to mind, baby, you're going to have to give me that ass. And funny how it works out, huh? I didn't say that to her because <laughs> she would have said, fuck off and die or something remotely resembling that. I, I guess said, you don't afterwards. want that job that bad then, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, she was into it too at that time. Right. But that's how it arises. It is something comes to mind that is a maybe a, a hint or a nudge to say, well, this might be a practice that you should engage with. It just seems weird. I don't understand the logic as to why certain things would come to mind for certain purposes and where that's coming from. Well, it may indeed be, call them what you want, the ascended masters, the nine unknown, the secret chiefs. They may be whispering in your ear, literally or through just intuition. Also, there may be something to the notion of an Akashic record, that is, something inherent in the universe, like the Fibonacci mathematical sequence, that one can tap into that really has all the answers. And it's not 41 for the Chuckers got well, that. See? Yeah, yeah, see, I rest my case. <laughs> but if you tap into it, I think trying to figure out where it came from is less important than does this pass the smell test? If it seems like bad advice, like uh, you want better grades, you need to sacrifice your teacher to the devil. Well, I would think long and hard about that and be satisfied with the grades you were getting or maybe hit the books a little bit or the screen a little bit, I guess, for the young folks. Right. You talk to the wrong spirit. And it's like, well, you got an A on the test, but you will spend the rest of your life in prison. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you got an A and you're going to the chair. <laughs> the bad news and the good news, you know, but right. you, you really really need to take the intuition for what it is and then process it through, does this make sense for me and for my reality or not? If it's something, you know, ridiculous, you need to write it down in your magical diary so that maybe it doesn't make sense to you now, but 20 years from now, you may go, gosh. That was talking about fill in the blank. But if it makes sense and it passes the sniff test, then go for it. Hmm. Fair. If you want to do a five hour show on what the source of magical knowledge may be, I'll be glad to be one of the participants in that because I have my own theories about that. But that is a whole nother ball game. And I didn't write the uh, grail within to mine that mystery. I wrote it for the practical understanding and use of sexual magic because everybody else that has some handle on that seems to be bent on secrecy and the cat is out of the bag, so to speak. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to do anything to be curious about it. And you don't have to do anything to hear stories from a person who has engaged with these things in their life and has stories to tell. And so what? You know, so I appreciate you being candid and blunt and writing this book and being able to talk about the things you talk about. And You've certainly lived your life to the fullest. <laughs> and before I cut you loose, remind people where they can get the book and the other work that you have out there that we might want to plug. Well, I, I mentioned that I have some stuff upcoming, which includes a book working title is Saucers and Saucerers. Ooh. I don't know if that will be the actual title. That isn't up to me. But that basically is a diary that I kept in the 1970s and 80s of the younger generation at that time of ufologists, of which moi was one. And I think that there is too little attention given to the people involved in 
magic and the occult and ufology and cryptozoology and parapsychology. And you don't want a People magazine sort of approach, but you do need to know the participants because if I'm correct, they become part of the mystery itself. It's always the case. You can see that with Hellier. That's one of the reasons I'm so big on that particular series because they're definitely a co-participant in the synchronicities that they're following. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that they started out to be that, but it obviously became the case. So Saucers and Saucers, under whatever name, will be out at some near future point. I think the book Dr. Randolph's Magic Elixir is in print. My book on the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, which was originally published by a Swedish publisher for reasons best forgotten, but has been out of print for a long time. And I am told by my enthusiastic publisher is either back in print or will be back in print shortly. And you can get a copy now of the original edition from one of the used book people for a ridiculous price of which I get nothing. So mm -hmm. wait for this one, folks. And the uh, Complete Right of Memphis is out there. I mean, I think it's had its day, but the people who would be interested in the ceremonial aspect of this stuff, it's there. And I will mention where there is in a moment. And then there is the Complete Secret Cipher, the Euphonauts, which keeps having, if you don't believe in reincarnation, you got to believe in reincarnation now because that book keeps lapsing. And then there's a new torrent of people who discover it. And, you know, I don't know how long that will last, but keep them coming. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, what we've been talking about, The Grail Within, I tried to keep the book tasteful, but I also tried to make it candid. Mm -hmm. And I hope I struck the right combination there. The only way for you to check is to buy the book, which you can get from all of the usual online outlets, Book Depository, Barnes & Noble, or most quickly, I guess, would be from Amazon. And they're all under the imprint of the Celestial Lodge of Sirius Press. Well, now, the one you didn't mention is God Never Does the Same Thing Twice, which I understand is about General Patton meeting the golem. Well, there's a section about that, but I never mentioned that book anymore, and I've even asked my publisher to take it out of circulation, which I believe. The reason being, the title, it's like I try to avoid using the title bishop, not because the position, which I regard as egregoric, is not important, but because people take it to mean some specific religious connection. And having seen what happened with Philema becoming a religion, when I got involved, I thought it was a philosophy of life. I don't want to pin that on something that I think is not what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I think the egregore belongs to all kinds of traditions, and it depends on how you manifest it. So I, I use alternative terms for that, you know, and I don't use the word consecration in a present day sense. I use the term empowerment because that speaks to my particular approach. Whereas some people, if it, you know, if it has religious connotations for them, which is fine, then it would be a consecration or ordination, depending. But I don't see this as a religious thing at all. I mean, I have moderate views on religious matters. Mm -hmm. you know, Reform Judaism is my cult, which is not a cult. You know? <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, mostly it's doing good deeds and making the world a tiny bit better. Well, there you go. Yes, I certainly think no one should have a monopoly on magic or the mechanisms and and techniques to improve one's life and you shouldn't have to pay for that either it seems to be part of the natural order of the world and it should be accessible as such so i agree with you there but right on man i really learned a lot from the book it was fun to talk to you again take care out there keep fighting the good fight i'll do my best how do i leave this gracefully y'all buy the books here 
<laughs> that works. I grew up in Missouri, so that resonates. I'm from Missouri. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, take care, man. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. And there it is, people. The train goes in the tunnel. We really went for it with this one. You know, the last time Alan was here and we focused on the secret cipher of the Euphonauts, it was a really good interview, if you ask me. That work did more to weave UFOs and quote-unquote aliens in with the occult and summoning and ritual than really any other work. So I hold him and that book up in high regard. And when I was approached with the re-release of The Grail Within, I thought, well, sure, why not? Also, we just had another episode where our guest mentioned briefly that sex magic is the central secret of secret societies and Freemasonry. I want to say it was Marty Leeds, but I am kind of drawing a blank. But that was like a cracking open of the door to this idea. And then Alan's publisher reached out with this pitch and... Really, we blew the door wide open on that idea, so it all seemed really fortuitous, especially at a time when I was trying to put out content with a lot of other things going on, like that big trip. So it was an easy yes for me. Of course, if you caught the Chris Rock slap comment, this was recorded the morning after the Oscars. Obviously, several weeks have passed, but I needed to have enough material to cover my trip and not be scrambling when I got back, and sex magic seemed like a pretty timeless topic, wouldn't you say? It was a little tough to stay focused on the material in this interview, but I kept trying to bring it back. You guys know how I do. And some people aren't going to like this one. I'm pretty sure of that. But there shouldn't be anything wrong with exploring sexuality or magic or both with good intentions. Obviously, no one's talking about abuse here. Everyone is a willing participant. And I shouldn't even have to add a list of the conventional caveats. Besides, the people who don't need them will just be rolling their eyes and be sick of hearing these things. And the people who do need caveats and disclaimers, well, they've already made up their mind that they hate this. So it is what it is. I'm curious about secrets. I'm curious about magic. And I guess I'm curious about how sexual energy can be used for magic. It's not really an endorsement or a recommendation for you to do this stuff. But I've always enjoyed listening to the stories of people who have had a wild life in one way or another. And to me, that should be fine to just be curious and interested. Have you ever heard Freeway Ricky Ross telling his stories about selling crack for the government in the L.A. ghettos? It's interesting. Doesn't mean you should sell crack for the government in L.A. ghettos. But here's a question for you. Let's say in the context of the right sexual experience, you meditate, you concentrate on your aim, as does your partner, you cycle that energy, you do the rhythmic breathing together, and it's a very intense, energetically potent session. And the last thing you need to do to take in all this energy towards that aim that's clearly important to you and your partner, is to both consume the mixture of fluids. Who's doing it? <laughs> I definitely think it's a little funny that I know all straight guys are going to get very squeamish about that. And women too. If you end your sexual experience by scooping up your own load and eating it, imagine the horror on a woman's face who wasn't expecting that. And I imagine the consuming of those joint fluids by both partners happens so rarely that if it was the key to manifesting all your dreams, would anybody know? Maybe that's what the initiatory orders are for. Ease you in slowly. <laughs> and how badly do you want your dreams? If you really want to manifest that new job or a new house or you need something to go just right, do you set your wife down and say, listen, <laughs> so I heard about this thing. <laughs> it's like on one hand, I can understand the process and the energy and what's being described and see how it could have some real potency to it. And on the other hand, how many people are going to let the awkwardness of it all stand in the way 
of the things you want or need most? Answer, almost everybody. <laughs> but it's interesting to hear about, right? And I didn't mean to mock the process when I made that comment about the, you know, spirit saying you got to get that ass. But that's also kind of funny to me. And of course, it requires mental training and practice, as Alan was trying to be very clear about. But if the process is, think about the thing you want, like finding an affordable homestead in Texas, and then whatever sexual thoughts pop into a guy's head become the way to get that thing, it's like very convenient, isn't it? <laughs> you get to manifest two desires with one stone or something like that. Maybe manifesting desires are pretty easy for certain spirits, and they just want to see the humans bumble around. But yes, Alan said a few things that I know are going to make some people out there wince. I hope that they can cut around those things and find something valuable or at least interesting to take away from this. I even had a bit of a reaction to the eugenicists comment in the second hour. I can let a lot of things go without cutting in, but I did feel like you guys would beat me up pretty bad if I didn't step in there. I get his point overall but there are still aspects of morality that I consider pretty timeless. But many people will get away with whatever their times will allow, so you gotta watch out. Either way, unexpected topic, I'm sure, and be glad that Alan dances with the shadow self so you don't have to. Personally, I'm very much into unexpected topics, because lately, as a consumer of media and podcasts, it just seems like every week has a big story. And then I have to hear a thousand different takes across the various news shows I listen to, right on down to the comedy podcasts that I like. First it was COVID and all its subtopics, then Russia, Ukraine, then the Will Smith slap, then the Johnny Depp trial, then Elon buying Twitter... Now this week, it's abortion rights, and it's honestly every freaking show or person I follow. I find myself with some downtime, and I start cycling through the stuff I like, and it's just 14 different takes on the stupid Johnny Depp trial or what Elon's going to do with Twitter. It's just theme of the week after theme of the week, and it's really annoying to me. So luckily, we have a format here where, yes, some things are too big and too on theme to not talk about, like Russia, Ukraine, and the big COVID op. But we can dodge a lot of this other shit and talk about stuff nobody's talking about. Andy Warhol, Peruvian, Karen Dismo traditions, and sex magic. I like it. Because I'm really sick of the story of the week stuff. It's a big world out there. Let's get a little more creative, right? Anyway, in higher side news, the big thing is that we finally have something solid for the higher side chats rune soup crossover event. If you are fans of Gordon and I and you want to hang out with us together, it is the first time we've ever done an event. And even better, it's completely free. But it is only open to members. And you know, if you don't like that, sorry. But our members are important to us. We talked about this a lot. And really, we just had such a hard time nailing down a venue in Austin or San Antonio. I talked to probably two dozen places, and it was always one issue or another. All we really needed was a stage, two microphones, 200 chairs, and food and drink. We had one brewery that was looking pretty good, but everybody would have to stand, and it was capped at 90 people. So when it costs us both, say, a thousand bucks to get there and get a room for two nights, and to rent the brewery itself costs two grand, then, if we charged 90 people $40, that's only 3600 bucks, And that's just one example, but the math kept not working out unless we charged 50 bucks or more, and that didn't feel right, really. So we made it more casual, and it's essentially a meetup. But I'm still trying to make a part of it, me and Gordon with microphones, and we take questions from you guys, because I think that's more fun overall. But either way, the important thing is that it's free, and I'm really psyched about it. Now, if you're interested in going, it's going to be in Austin, Texas on June 25th on Gordon's birthday. And if you're a Plus member who wants to go, just log into the website and click the big banner at the top of the page. I put it up there this morning that will take you to the form where you can get on the guest list. And yes, you can bring up to four friends. I've already heard from people who are traveling pretty far away for this, which is humbling. But hey, make it a nice break from life. Take the weekend, and the event is free at least, right? 
And we also have an event specific Telegram group you can join to start talking to other people who will be there and get any updates that we might need to give you guys along the way. But we got food, drink, and me and the Tasmanian devil himself. And because the members already support us, it's just a big thank you and a good time. So again, log on to thehiresidechats.com, click the banner, fill out the form, and you're on the guest list. The event doesn't have a hard limit per se, but if it gets up to a certain number, we will have to pump the brakes. So please get in early if you want to go and join that telegram for the updates. Also, Gordon is doing some workshops the day before and day after, I think. So check his website for those details or ask in the Telegram group. I'm sure people will be very helpful. And with that, big thanks to Alan for another great interview. In the second hour for Plus People Today, we got into some pretty wild stuff. The Gnostic Mass and the Eucharist, dwindling membership in initiatory orders, the power of those sexual fluids, Sigil sex magic versus traditional methods, solo sex magic, tornado talisman tales, and a pretty wild section about the star child ritual and people who Alan knows who were born under those protocols. You gotta support the stuff you like, and it's even better when they give you more content for that support. And that's what we do around here, independent and sponsorship free. And I hope to see you guys at the first plus member meetup slash first higher side soup meetup. Maybe we make it a thing. Let's see how it goes. But thanks for listening. Get the grail within if you want all the gory details of Alan's esoteric sexcapades, and I'll talk to you next time. I've done my part. Your move, sex magic secret keepers, personal power suppressors, and esoteric orders of the dues collecting kind. Your fucking move. Sweet dreams to the alley. Calling them out on TAC Uncovering secrets and conspiracies Everybody's looking for something Some of them want to use you Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be abused And that is another show complete. Remember, as much as you enjoyed this, which is just the free first hour, I hope you'll become a Plus member to hear the full two-hour interviews. You also can engage with other Plus members in the comments and the forums. And you'll find your answer to one of the most common questions I get, which is where can I find those cover songs that you use at the end of the show? Well, they are free downloads for Plus members too. And without Plus members, I can't hire the occasional musician to bring these odd cover song ideas to fruition. Plus members are how I'm able to do what I do without ads and without the big machine being on my back. We can fit so much more into a two-hour interview, and I do my best to make it worth your time and money. The conversation only gets deeper, weirder, and more controversial in that private hour. How could it not the way things are going? But the best way to sign up is at thehiresidechats.com where new first-time subscribers always get a free seven-day trial because I'm just that confident. There's no PayPal on the website, but if you need to use PayPal, then sign up through Patreon and you get all the same episodes. Our website is a credit or debit system, but you can also scope out the other options like a few various cryptos, cash or check mailed to the P.O. Box, 
And I'll even barter with most people if you have your own business and produce something nice that my wife or kid or taste buds might like. But the architects of consensus reality have made it clear that these themes and topics aren't really welcome on the main stage. And so this is how we secure a little counterculture corner for ourselves, and I hope you'll join Plus because that is the only way it works. Besides, you can cancel anytime right on your profile page. The most common concern I hear is people just being unsure if THC Plus will work with their podcast app, and the answer is probably yes. But if not, we have several high-level app recommendations for whatever phone you use, and the website is made for mobile too. We're trained to tip a waitress for bringing us a sandwich, but that tip doesn't give you access to a second sandwich. Really, I'm not asking for any more than that, and I think I offer a better service. Come get your second serving of tasty conspiracy goodness in exchange for that small token of your appreciation. Beyond that, let it also be known that we have grown and survived as long as we have by word of mouth. I don't care so much about social media likes or follows, but tell the right people about THC. And not just listeners, but the high-level figures who are better suited to sit down with me than most other hosts. And if you can help me with any of these things, I can work to bring you better shows, which is just a win-win for both of us. Informative, entertaining, and action-packed. It also never hurts to thank a guest you liked if you have the time either. We want them to know people are listening, so they're willing to come back down the road too. Thank you for spending some time with me and cheers to a better tomorrow.